disciple. Agape Temple. Believe, obey, love, and disciple. Bold. We need to be bold today, especially as millions around the world are living in a state of fear. We need to rise to the occasion for God never gave us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be bold for Christ. Let the world know that Jesus Christ is still God. He is the author and finisher of your faith. And I know if we lean on him and trust in him, he will take us through any trial, any problem, any dilemma. I want to thank you for stopping by our live stream today. And I know that as you view the content, that God will bless you tremendously. So position yourself for this blessing. Happy Sabbath, Agape family. It is such a privilege to welcome each and every one of you this morning. I am so glad that you've decided to join us. So whether you're in your, your bedroom, your living room, your family, wherever you are, we are so glad you've decided to join us. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us for the very first time, a special welcome to you. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, in fact, when we're back in our church building, we would love to see you. So make sure you let us know that you watch us on live stream and when we're in our building, you come and visit us, all right? For our regular members, we are so glad that you've decided to spend some time with us once again. All right, we look forward to when we're back together in the church so we can fellowship. Uh, two things quickly, just a reminder that each Sabbath morning at 9.30 a.m. we have our Sabbath school class. And guess what? You don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to worry about getting up, getting ready or anything like that. You just simply click on a link and just like that, you're in your Sabbath school class and you're studying and learning God's word, all right? So don't forget 9.30 a.m. Sabbath mornings. If you don't know where to get the link from, there's going to be an email below in the description. If you just send an email there, we'll make sure we add your phone number or email to the distribution list. That way you can receive the Zoom links when they come out, all right? Uh, next thing, I have a challenge for each and every one of us this week. This week, I would like each of us to call two people. Two people I'd like for you to call this week, okay? And just, you know, whether you pray for them or pray with them or read the scripture with them, just touch base and say hi. I'm sure they would love to hear from you. I'm gonna look out for my two calls from you, okay? So thank you once again. May God continue to richly bless you this day and have a happy Sabbath. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We serve a God that is ever-present and is continually wanting the best for us as a people. And because we are his children, he loves us with an everlasting love. Welcome once again. And um, during this Pastor's Corner, um, I'm sure many of you have heard the announcement given by the province that um, churches are allowed to be open to a certain extent. I believe it is 30% of the congregation's regular attendance 
that is permitted to come to the sanctuary and worship physically. Now, at the interior conference, um, we have uh, looked at and examined this uh, new mandate and feel that it's necessary, especially in the midst of this pandemic, to make sure that we meet all the criteria and plan as much as we can to ensure that our congregation returns to our house of worship safely. And so there is a multifaceted uh, step, steps rather, that we'll be sharing with you uh, as the weeks go on. But we want to have what we call a preparation phase, uh, beginning from the 8th of June, which has already passed, to the 30th of June, the end of this month, to ensure that we cross all our T's and dot all our I's because logistically it will be harder to reopen the church than to close it. And so we have some goals that we want to share with you in our preparatory phase. Uh, the first is to create confidence in the congregation as it plans to return to church. Uh, by outlining a number of steps that needed to, uh, to be met and um, followed up with to ensure that we do so safely. Also, we want to identify our challenges, you know, things that would inhibit us as a church to bring worshipers back safely. We look at the, the building, the layout, how the church traffic will flow to ensure that we are practicing social or physical distancing. And the last is to get comfortable with our new normal. Um, instead of trying to look ahead of what life will be like beyond this pandemic, let us make the necessary changes to adapt to the current situation that we're in, which will allow for us to be in a mode of uh, ensuring that we are as safe as possible. And so the administration will meet at this local church to discuss how we can best, uh, if we are to reopen sometime in the near future, how we should best do so. Thank you very much. Keep us in prayer. I know we are excited because we miss the physical camaraderie we have here at the Agape Temple Church and uh, all the fun we have when we're in the building, in the place. So it's important for us to ensure, uh, even though we're excited, that we do so safely. And so please, as it is right now, we'll continue our online services and we will notify you once we have uh, made this plan of action and in consultation with the conference when we can actually open and what it will look like. May God richly bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath.
Hello, I am really happy to be sharing in this wonderful occasion with all of my Agape family members who will be graduating this year. Congratulations on your success and I wish you guys all the best and may God continue to richly bless you. Graduates of 2020, congratulations. This is a year like no other, but you are truly amazing. And do not let that take away from all of the accomplishments you've made so far. May God bless you on your journey. Graduates, I'm so happy to share in the excitement of your graduation and so very proud of you too. You are a unique history-making cohort. In order to accomplish this milestone, you had to demonstrate tenacity, resilience, and independence. Congratulations on your success, and may God bless you as you boldly begin your next adventure. Good morning, graduates. Congratulations to each and every one of you. I wish you all the best, and my advice to you is to continue to follow God's leading as you continue on your educational journey. Congratulations. Hey, 2020 grads, uh, this is Raekwon here. I just wanted to con congratulate you on your graduation here in the 2020 year. Uh, I just want to say that you should be motivated, excited, and happy about this moment. You're moving on to a new chapter in your life. Um, don't take it for granted. Soak up all the information you can, the life experiences, uh, the journey as it goes, and just take it on full force. Remember, keep God in your heart and just continue to strive for success. Hey, Agape grads, congratulations, class of 2020. You have had a really strange school year to say the least, but you did the work, you put in the time and your efforts have been rewarded. Congrats to all of you and all the best in your future endeavors.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we come to you now in a special way. Just want to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us, for giving us another day of life. Many are not as fortunate, so we don't want to take for granted that we are still alive. Therefore, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for providing for us, for giving us your love, your kindness, your blessing upon each of us, dear Lord. We just want to thank you. Lord, we want to ask that you forgive us of any sin that we've committed against you, the ones that we know about and the ones we're completely ignorant of. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to be stronger to avoid temptations in this life. Today I come asking you, dear Lord, you taught us through your word that we should keep asking and it shall be given unto us to keep seeking and we shall find, to keep knocking and doors will be opened unto us. So Lord, we come asking, knocking and seeking. First, we want to put before you those among us who are sick, dear Lord. You know each and every situation, dear Father. You know the names of our members who are not well, dear Lord. I ask that you be with each and every one of them. Bless them, dear Father. Help to heal them, dear Father, whether through medicine, mindset, or miracles. We know that you are able. So we place them in your hands now, dear Lord, knowing that you are a God that responds to our faith. And so we leave it in your hands today, dear Lord. For those who are tasked with taking care of those who are sick, dear Lord, especially during this time, dear Lord, we are thankful that you've placed it in their hearts to take care of the ones who are sick. We ask that you protect them, dear Lord, and to keep them strong through this time. Lord, I want to recognize those who are watching us for the very first time through a live stream program. You led them here for a reason, dear Lord, and we ask that you, uh, you be with them, dear Father. Help them, their hearts to be responsive to your message. Help them to recognize the love you have for them and that you want to see them in your family to be saved when you come. Lord, I want to lift up our Gabby family members. Many of us have been in isolation for months now. The strain and pressures are weighing down on so many, whether it be financial pressures, relationship issues, parenting issues, illnesses, or even just fear of these turbulent times. We ask that you give us strength, dear Father, to stay strong, wisdom to resolve our differences, and faith to stay close to you. Because we know that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, we want to remember today our graduates those who have graduated from their respective levels of education. Another chapter has ended in their life, and now new opportunities are, opportunities are on the horizon. Help them to stay the course, placing you first in their life, dear Lord, so that you may direct their path. In a special way, dear Lord, I'm asking you to be with our young people, dear Lord. The enemy seeks to deceive and divide them from your church. But I'm asking you to place a hedge of protection around them, dear Lord, so that the enemy cannot win in this battle for their soul. Lord, we want to remember today our pastor and his family, dear Lord. Continue to be with them, dear Lord. Continue to use them in a mighty way, dear Lord, to, you, to lead this part of your church and this part of the world. And so today, as he brings a word to us, dear Lord, we may, not, we may we not focus on him as the man, dear Lord, but as an instrument being used by you to deliver a powerful message of hope, love, and your never-ending faithfulness to us. We thank you once again, dear Lord. May our worship be acceptable in your sight. 
is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. season we're in you know I sit here and I had a lot of time to reflect looking at the fact that so many of us were stuck inside of our houses they actually finally just began to really open the doors for us but for the most part a lot of us have been really stuck we're stuck at home many of us we were sent home from work we no longer were able to be making our wages so the stresses began to build up you're trying to figure out how am i going to pay my rent how am i going to pay the mortgage all these bills are caving in around you you don't know what to do yes the government came out and said let me help you guys and they gave out their money but even still, it was a struggle for many of us. Our children were stuck at home. We almost had to start taking a role that we weren't used to taking anymore. We turn on the news, left and right, it's reminding us of pure tragedy. The tensions rising at home. Mood begins to get dark. You get cabin fever, you wanna go out. But how do you begin to deal with this? You know, it's amazing. They said during this time, abuse went up. Addiction problems went up. It, it's rather interesting. If you take a look even, stuff like the LCBO and the beer store were considered essential businesses. That is the kind of time we were in. People are trying to deal with this pressure. We were all going through a season of darkness. Let us bow our heads and pray. Great and heavenly God, Lord, you and you alone, you are the light of the world. So we ask of you to present us your word and shine your light. And Lord, remove me and stand in my place, that we may feed your sheep. In the wonderful, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Saints, friends, I ask of you to open your scriptures, whether it's through the phone or through the book. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to be reading a story of a very emotionally rough moment in Jesus' life. We're going to start at verse 22. And I read, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves. For the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke, spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. The title of this sermon is Surviving in a Season of Darkness. While we look at this passage, there are three things that I want to just briefly touch on that can help us be able to make it through our own personal seasons. Number one, you have to remember to step back. Number two, you have to be willing to step up. And thirdly, you have to step out. But before we step in, let's step backwards for the context of this story. And let's set the stage to see what is going on here. See, earlier in the book of, in chapter four of the book of Matthew, we see that Yeshua is having a very emotional day. The chapter, it begins with murder. Jesus' cousin, John the baptizer, he is dead. The one, John, who had the spirit of Elijah, the one who was known as the forerunner, the one who baptized Jesus himself. The one who would see the spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. The revolutionary. The one calling the people to repentance. This very man, John. He would be imprisoned and later killed. He would be beheaded. So his head could be a trophy for the wicked. Can you imagine the pain Jesus is experiencing when he hears this news? How his heart must have broke his beloved cousin, somebody who he reacted to when he was even still in the womb. Something must have began to break inside of him. Though he knew this was going to have to happen sooner or later. Hearing the news must have broke him. We even read in, chap in verse 13 of chapter 14. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Where was there? You see, he was coming from Nazareth. He was in his hometown. And... His heart was already broken because of the unbelief he had seen in his hometown. He had to get out. He had to seek some solitude. But the later portion of that verse, 
lets us see he doesn't even have a chance to properly mourn. Because in the later part of the verse 13, it says, but when the multitudes heard it, and that is that Jesus was gone into the mountains, they followed him on foot from the cities. Jesus' popularity made it so hard for him to find privacy. And here he's in a moment where it could do him so much good. Verse 14 informs us, though, that once he sees this multitude following after him, his heart would be moved to compassion. Jesus couldn't help it. He knew what his ministry was. And verse 14 reads, And when Jesus went out, he saw the great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. He didn't have time to mourn for himself, but he still continued to pour himself out for the people. In a sense, soon the place was flooded. Thousands of people there seeking Jesus. But the sun would soon be getting ready to go down. And this would lead to the event we know as feeding the multitudes. Stuck out in a deserted place until the evening approaches. And the disciples now, they're getting frustrated. Wanting to send the people away to go and look for food. For verse 15 reads, when, the eve, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy food by themselves. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. I could imagine the confusion that was on the disciples' face. Sitting there thinking, what is this guy talking about? All we got are a couple of pieces of fish and bread. In the Gospel of Luke, it says, this wouldn't even match a mouthful for each person here. I could see they were trying to figure out who is this man that he can make such requests. Who is this man we walk with? We soon do, see him do some really great things. But sometimes, sometimes he's asking for some impossible things. Well, this is where Jesus would perform the miracle, taking fish and bread, and he would feed thousands of people. After this miracle, we run into the head of our passage, which is in verse 22, where it reads, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. You see, when emotions begin to get high, and life begins to get dark and intense, we have to first step back, which leads us to our first point. We got to step back. Have you ever considered why the scriptures even say, immediately Jesus made? In the Greek, the words that compose this phrase is euthios anankasen which means immediately he's compelling them. It's as if he's forcing them to do something. He's telling them, you got to go. But why? It didn't really make sense when you're just reading through the book of Matthew. Why would he immediately push his disciples out after such a miracle? This is where the beauty of having different gospels comes in. And the Gospel of John brings this to light for us. Reading from John, 
chapter 6, verse 14 to 15. We read, And the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, and they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. Jesus knew the mindset of the crowd he was with. He knew that this mindset would disrupt what he was trying to do with the disciples. He knew that he had to separate his disciples from this infecting thought that was beginning to go around in this crowd. And what we got to realize is, Jesus' 12 is the kingdom of God at that moment. A small little group that he has planted the seed and he is grooming to help bring the kingdom to everyone. The church was living in this small group. And he was trying to keep them safe from having a seed planted that he did not want them to water. He did not even want them to try and entertain the thought. There was enough confusion about why Jesus and what he was supposed to do. So he had to make sure his disciples were preserved. So he forced his disciples to take a step back. And he himself would dispense the crowd. So he could take a step back. Jesus is already bearing the burden of his unmourned cousin. And now he's seen how his own compassion is being misinterpreted misunderstood he's caught the enemy once again like he did to him while he fasted in the desert trying to tempt him with being the king of the area and when he when 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 he sees that this pressure is getting too intense he has to withdraw he has to pull back you see we ourselves got to realize when life begins to surround us with darkness, when it begins to get so intense, we have to remember to step back. You see, sometimes we try to take on too much. <laughs> sometimes we misinterpret Philippians 4 verse 13 and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But when we read it in its proper context, this verse goes for what God has asked you to do. But when we take up things that we were not ordained to take up, we normally suffer some dire consequences. We pick up burdens sometimes that were not for us to carry. We exhaust ourselves trying to wear way too many hats. Sometimes we're so busy trying to save the world and everyone around us. But the sad thing is we haven't even saved our own family. Or even worse, we haven't saved ourselves. We have to step back. We have to get outside the situation to get a better perspective. We need a moment where we can breathe. Slowing it down to breathe while we step back and regroup. You know, as I was preparing this sermon, it reminded me of a point in my life. It happened actually rather recently, about a year or two ago. And I was at work and I watched my body slowly beginning to break down. And I couldn't understand what was going on. I was building something called an operator. And as I'm wiring it, my eyes began to get fuzzy. I'd shake it off, drink some water. I didn't necessarily have headache pain. But then all of a sudden, I felt my hand getting tingly. And then I felt the tingling traveling. I could feel 
the nerves in my legs slowly firing off and going numb. I became so worried. All I began to think is, am I going to have a stroke? Am I about to have a heart attack? What's going on? And my body was shutting down as I was at my workstation. And I got up off my stool and walked over to our lead hand supervisor. And I began to explain to him what's going on. And the funniest thing is, while I was trying to speak to him, my words couldn't even come out properly. They weren't necessarily slurred, but they were very slow. And I could think the words in my mind. But for whatever reason, they wouldn't transmit all the way to my mouth so I could speak. They ended up carrying me to the hospital. Ambulance came. They did their check. They didn't, weren't certain what was going on. Long story short, when the doctors checked me out, they said, you're not having a stroke. And you weren't having a heart attack. And I'm thinking, what else could it have been? Did it something pop in my brain? The way my body collapsed down. And by the time I reached the hospital, the amount of pain I was in. I sat there saying, then what is it? What, what, what's going on? And the doctor said, you're having a migraine. And I sat there and I said, why is this man lying to me? They talked to... My wife and my parents, well, my mother came with my sister to come look for me. And they're telling them the same thing because I couldn't even hear nothing. As I was trying to listen, the words were penetrating through my head and causing such sincere pain. And I couldn't understand totally what was going on. As slowly when I was able to listen more and hear what the doctor had to say. He said, yeah. You had a migraine, and just by chance, the amount of swelling that took place, it caused pressure to the right parts of your brain that would cause your body to shut down. This is why you lost the feeling in your arms and in your legs. This is why you could not speak. And I did not know a migraine could do such a thing. And he said to me, yeah, you just had a body migraine, and the body couldn't deal with it. They sent me to a neurologist to get things checked out. And the reason why I share this story was the neurologist began to ask me a series of questions. What's life like at home? Uh, what are you doing for exercise? How is work? And by the end of his short interrogation, he said, my friend, stress caused your migraine. He said, you're going to have to try and figure out how to start monitoring things, start delegating, start letting go of certain things. And I remember even at the church, we had a big day coming the next day. I had to sit back. I had to let somebody else lead. And as much as it broke my heart, I was humbled to learn a lesson of being aware of my environment and knowing when to step back. We've all got to know that spot. Listen to the people around you when they're letting you know, it seems like you got a lot on your plate. Because you might be going through the ringer and think, well, as long as I pray, I can make it through this. Don't ever believe just because it's gotten so, the pressure's gotten so intense and God has kept you up that he never wanted you to just fall back and sit down. Because we see Jesus do this himself. We have to stop. We have to step back. Because stress is no joke. The world we're in today, I see, you know, it's rather interesting. I see people who have been at home able to do whatever they want to do. But when you're having talks with them, not living their regular life has brought a brand new type of stress. We have to take that time also and breathe. Seeing what was going on in their minds of the multitudes, Jesus had to step back. He was not about letting man come in 
to tell him how his ministry was supposed to go. He knew they wanted to take him by force and make him king. But I could see his mind probably recalling Psalms like Psalms 118 verse 8 saying, it is better to put your trust in God than to put your trust in man. Jesus didn't want no part in that. He didn't want his disciples being corrupted with the seed. So he did what he had to do to save his family. He did what he had to do to preserve himself. He compelled them to step back. Get out of here. Get on the boat and get as far away. And then he himself stepped back. And in solitude, he would follow through to the next step. In prayer and isolation, Jesus would step up. In verse 23, we read, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. We often forget the power of prayer. We often forget prayer is a breath that should be taken every moment. Taking the time to stop and humble oneself to seek the one true God is a blessing we have no clue of the power it contains. To seek guidance from the creator of the universe, the one who from nothing can mold and create this intricate world that nobody can truly understand. To seek our heavenly father and ask him for help. In stepping away and up into the hills, Yeshua was able to survey the area. He was able to stop and take time to take a personal inventory and manage his emotional state. He would lay his heart out to his father. Resting on truths that we read of in Psalms 18 verse 2 that would read, the Lord is my rock. My fortress and my deliverer, my God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn of salvation, my stronghold. I could see Jesus on the hill and my imagination sits there and can see him crying out, Father, did John really have to die like that? There couldn't have been another way? Or, or why did my hometown not accept me? They grew me. They knew me. But why didn't they want to believe? Why didn't they think I would be the one to share the gospel you have promised to give them? When I think about how Jesus' mind was thinking in an eternal thought. I wonder if he sat there also saying, Father, Father, they are all so broken. But you see, to reach this position, where one can actually begin to reason with God, where one can calm the flesh and hear the spirit, one has to slow down and step up to honestly survey what's going on inside. We have to take an honest personal inventory. This is such a powerful thing. Whenever I'm coaching some people, one of the first things when we realize there are certain issues we deal with is we have them write down what is the problems you see holding you back or that are in the way of you accomplishing your missions and your goals. And there's a, there's a trick and beauty in actually writing something out. There is something that happens in the brain when you begin to take your thought and literally write it out with a pen and paper. 
And it's, it's rather interesting because this has a more effective response on the brain than if you were to text it out on your phone or type it out on your computer. There is something that seems to happen in the brain when you physically write with a pen on paper. Not only that, when you see your thoughts written down on paper, you are now have to force, you are forced now to face the reality of what you are thinking. It's amazing in the mind, everything can flash in and out. And even while you dwell on it, you don't understand the truth of everything you're manifesting. But once you bring it to life, Bring it from the mind and create it into life by putting it on paper. Your mind begins to respond to it differently. We begin to actually see where our choices have brought us. And then when we face our choices, we can then step up and be accountable for each one of them. We can be ready to face the consequences that come along with them. But we have to be honest with ourselves and honest with God. God doesn't need you to be honest with him for his sake. He already knows. But being honest with him for your sake is freedom. After we've been honest and we've laid it out and we faced it, we have to be willing to seek healthy, godly counsel. Open to constructive Criticism. Things that can help us move forward. For the wise man wrote in Proverbs 11 verse 14, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. See, once you have stepped up and surveyed the situation, once you have regrouped, and once you are ready to go back in, it is time to take action. It is time to step out. It is time to move in faith. It is time to know that God is with you. Which leads us to our last step. We have to step out. In Matthew 14, jumping back to verse 24, as we begin to read, it says, And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, now in the fourth watch of the night. Now, some people might be wondering, when is the fourth watch? I do not understand this timing. Now, this is somewhere between 3 to 6 a.m. This is still in darkness. They still got a little while before the sun begins to start peaking. Now, can you imagine, though, in the middle of the night, you are stuck in the middle of a boat and the sea, and these are fishermen. This is how we know this storm was something serious, because these fishermen who are used to a boat are now freaking out from being in this storm. One of the gospel recites that Jesus seen them struggling to try an oar while the boat was out there. And so at this time, this is when they're going through it. And Jesus went to them. You see, my friends, we got to realize Jesus will never leave us alone. Anytime a storm begins to happen to us, anytime darkness begins to surround us, Jesus is already on his way to meet us. Jesus is already looking, how can I save you? How may I show my light? And when it gets really rough, Jesus is there ready to carry us. Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. You know, walking on the sea. We, we, we haven't realized sometimes the very thing you fear, Jesus will use as a footstool to reach you. They were frightened of what the water was going to do. And here came their God walking on the water 
to save them. Sometimes we have many things in our lives that begin to hinder what we are capable of doing. We allow the fear of whatever it is. Maybe somebody told you that you can't do it. Maybe somebody told you the money isn't there. Maybe somebody told you you don't have these skills. Maybe somebody just simply told you you're not worth it. God will trample that to show you he can carry you where no one else could ever believe you could be. This is our God. Our God is a redeemer. Our God is our salvation. He is there to save us. And anytime we are in these moments where darkness and the enemy has pressured in, I guarantee you Jesus is there getting ready to do what he has done for Peter. But what is that, you ask? Well, let's read on. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. You know, I was thinking about this. If I wasn't, okay, I like canoes. I like being in boats. I even like playing in water. But there's this fear I'm still trying to overcome. When I'm in a swimming pool or on a beach or something, and I go just far enough out where all of a sudden my feet can't touch the ground anymore, Ooh. my heart starts panicking. I start getting scared. I start breathing shallow. I can't imagine what it must have been like in the middle of the night to have the boat slowly getting flooded up and getting tossed to and fro, and you're rowing as hard as you can, and you can't do nothing. You are at the will of the sea. Not to mention, it's bad enough that we are struggling in the storm to look over the side and there has to be a ghost coming. I don't even want to know what I would have done in that situation. But what does Christ do? The same thing God does to everyone he approaches. The word writes, but immediately after they shouted with fear, immediately he spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. It is I. How many times do we not realize when God reached out to us, we are not to run, but we are to embrace the God of the universe has humbled himself to reach out to dirty old me. God will always make his presence known. Especially when he knows you've had enough. He never gives you more than you can bear. So when that boiling point really comes, he always shows up. And he will always take you and lead you from that moment. Fear flees from the face of God. And as long as we remain in Christ, we can step out as Christ has stepped out for us. Peter shows us how amazing it is to have the power of keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. Verse 28 says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, Come. Come. You know what was beautiful? Peter at this moment was honest enough with himself to not say, Lord, ask me to come to the water. Because he already knew there may be inklings of doubt, there may be something in him that would deter him from stepping out. But he believed in Jesus to be his savior, his leader, his truth, his answer. He believed in him so much, he would say, command me to do it. Don't give me the option. And Jesus said, come. We have to realize every time we reach out to God and ask him for help, ask him for courage, ask him to be more loving, ask him to not be so prideful, ask them not to be so angry. His answer is, come. 
let me give you what you're looking for. I could see Peter reflecting for a moment. This is the same one who told me in Mark 11 verse 24. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it and it will be yours. Peter mustered up all the courage and faith he had. And he stepped out onto the water. I could imagine what was going through his mind. He might have even dipped his toe at one point and saying, it's still soft. I, I even wonder, did he reach out and wave his hand and realize it's still water? But the moment he planted his feet on the water, what kind of glory began to fill his body when he was experiencing what it is to truly trust God? As we keep reading, it says, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. How many of us fall into that? God has delivered us into something and we're walking out in faith. We are accomplishing what he has promised. But then we take our eyes off of Jesus and we look around what is going on. And then we start focusing on the problems around us. We reach a point. Where now the problem is in front of Jesus. This happens to many of us. Every time we put a doubt in front of Jesus, we help ourselves sink a little. Every time we put a bad habit, every time we put anything in front of the path that God has already directed us to take, anything that is easily going to make us stumble, while Christ is sitting there saying, come, and we begin to do the impossible, we see it, other people recognize, but when that cloud begins to come, if we turn our eyes, we'll begin to slip because we're focusing on the wrong things. The news that comes on. So much injustice, so much hate and anger. What happens when we take our eyes off Jesus? We start filling our own heart with a hate and with anger. Christ alone is what we got to keep our eyes on to make it through. But the beauty is, like Peter, we always have the ability to cry out, Lord, save me. We have to keep our eyes on Christ. And as long as you do not keep your eyes on Christ and keep the word buried in your heart, keep a prayer on your tongue, you are left to focus on the things of this fallen world all around you. And the beautiful thing is when we do slip, First John lets us know, if you have sinned, if you've fallen, Jesus will forgive you. We have an advocate. We have someone there. And just the same way, he helped Peter, for if we keep reading, we read, when Peter calls out and says, Lord, save me, the word writes immediately. Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? You know the beautiful thing is while we were falling, Jesus didn't reach out his hand and tell you to grab him. He reaches out his hand to catch you. And he will lift us back. And why do we doubt? Why do we doubt? Why do we fill ourselves with so much fear? We were told we don't have a spirit of fear. But of power. And a sound mind. But we can only reap this fruit. 
the more we abide in Christ. After he reached for Peter, it reads, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came to worship. And they worshipped him saying, truly you are the son of God. In that moment, the disciples made a shift in their belief. At that very moment, they moved from seeing Jesus as this miraculous rabbi, as possibly the prophet spoken of, wondering what is he capable of. And they seen him as the true son of God. They seen him as the one worthy to be worshipped. Throughout their ministry, while they've been working with Jesus, there was a, a question ringing through their mind. Who is this man? On that night, they answered the question. My friends, as I wind down. The world may seem like it is falling apart. Darkness and pain may, may, may be surrounding all of us. May have clouded in and made the room to breathe small. I'll tell you the truth for me. This whole COVID-19 season has disrupted my flow. And I had two options. Sit down and start fearing. Or go to the one who walks on fear and get closer. Some people, I know you've lost your jobs. You left and you thought when things would start reopening, you were going to get it back. And you're making those calls. When are we opening up? You know, some of your friends managed to have gotten back in, but you're still at home. Some of us, we're trying to figure out what do we do with our kids? The bills are still going. We hear the warnings. They may be cutting off the Serbs so the money from the government will stop. We're left in all this world of uncertainty and the pressure is getting to us. The stress levels are rising continually. Not only at home, even all around us. Because it's rather interesting now that we have been released from our homes... We don't behave the way we used to. It's sad, but we also even see believers, because of everything and all the pressure, slowly falling away from their faith to go live by their feelings. We all want change. And we all want to step out. But I want to encourage you, you must step out in Christ. We are in the last days. Any moment now, if we take a good look at what's going on, our king is going to come bursting through the clouds. And we have to realize the reality of that. He is not waiting for us to understand what has been fulfilled and what hasn't. He will come when he is ready. He is the way and the light. He is the life and the resurrection. Jesus is our only act answer. And he is the only way to make it out alive. My friends, if you find yourself going through a season of darkness, I encourage you. It is time to step back. It is time to step up to God and get a better perspective. And then step out in faith. And amidst your storm, amidst all this darkness, you will give praise as you walk on water. Let us pray. Oh, great and holy God. 
people are hurt. People are lost. People are scared. People are angry. The world has confused us so much. We don't know who to trust anymore. The news has so many sides, it leaves you confused. Lord, amongst all the darkness, we need your light to shine. We need to see you walk and burst through. Walk on that water towards us. And reach out. And Lord, grab us. Lord, I know you're out there. So I ask of you on behalf of everyone out there. We beg of you, command us to walk to you on water. Lord, we may be lacking faith. Please help us where we do lack. Lord, if we can't build a mustard seed, help us with our grain. But Lord, we put in our faith and trust in you. Because we want to remain standing as the world falls apart so people will know why. It makes such a difference to have you in our life. We thank you for hearing. We thank you for answering our prayers. And Lord, please continue to bless each and every one of us. And please never let go of us. Even if out of fear we let go of you. In the wonderful name of the mighty God of the universe. And of our King. We pray to you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a blessing having you partake in this worship experience. God is an amazing God. And when we are met with concerns or issues, our first inclination needs to be to put it before the Lord. I hope God blesses you with a wonderful week. And if you want to be a blessing to us as a church uh, at our website, agapetemplesda.com uh, under the given tab there are some ways to contribute to the ministry uh, steps will be there videos will be there to walk you through the process but may god richly bless you as you seek to serve him and move in his name